Hello everyone. Welcome to this new episode of the Power Series. Today, Positive Luxury's co-founder and CEO, Diana Verdenieto, will be in conversation with Valérie Keller, co-founder and CEO of Imagine, and Paul Polman, co-founder and chair of Imagine. Imagine works with CEO global leadership teams to help them to achieve their commitments to the global goals. In this webinar, we'll be uh, discussing the power of good leadership and what it means to be a good leader when circumstances are not optimal. We will have 15 minutes uh, at the end of the talk to answer all the questions. So please submit them uh, in the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end. Over to you, Diana. Thank you very much, Claudia, and good afternoon. It's a real honor and privilege uh, to spend the next 45 minutes with you. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us and for your time. And thank you so much, Valerie, for, for being here, virtually being here. Um, so today we are talking about you know, good leadership. And, um, and this is very, very important because obviously we can't deny that the last six weeks has been incredibly challenging, but the next probably uh, five, six months is going to be even more challenging. So I, th I think I'll, I'd like to start with you, Paul, if I may. I mean, how, uh, how to lead in these turbulent times and which leadership styles will prevail um, in the current crisis? And also, what makes good leadership? Well, I think a lot of the changes that were needed in leadership have uh, already started before the crisis but the crisis might have a little bit accelerated it. So I'm not sure that because we have the crisis right now, we need different leadership, but we certainly need to put some of our skills higher. We have seen the trend to AI and technology that requires uh, different leadership and, and different ways of working. We've seen the pace of change always picking up even more so during COVID. We see new employees coming in that have a higher sense of purpose and a different understanding of authority. We obviously have also seen the importance of multi-stakeholder models where morals and ethics have been pushed to a higher level. And then the effects of a being an interdependent world, again, what COVID has shown us, requires other different leadership skills. I've always said that the best leadership skills actually moving forward, even more so, now so than ever, are actually the skills that the female uh, uh, gender, if you want to, processes better than others. These are skills like humility, empathy, compassion. Um, it, even more so now than ever, you need these collaborative relationships. And it is not surprising that if you look at the crisis and the countries that do best, countries like Denmark, like Iceland, like New Zealand, like Norway, Finland, they're actually all led by uh, Taiwan. They're all led by female leaders. So I don't think that is a surprise. So it's that higher level of moral leadership that we're really talking about. Hmm. Oh, Diana, I think you're unmuted. So, sorry, yes, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, I mean, Valerie, I mean, you, you look at this from a, a slightly different lens because you are actually working with multiple stakeholders. So what makes good leadership from, from where you see it as the CEO of Imagine? I think Paul actually said it really well. I mean, leadership is contextual, right? So what kind of leadership is needed is like, well, what is the environment, right? What are we leading for and who are we leading? And so if you take that frame, it says leadership is contextual. What's needed now in this moment where we have truly a historic, a historic pause that allows us to fundamentally rethink what are our lives about? What are our businesses about? How we make, how we take, how we consume. I mean, no matter who we talk with, whatever webinar we're in, fundamentally that's kind of, we have a shared human experience that is allowing us a little bit of a pause to then think, how do we do this differently? And I think what we're seeing, and, and Paul and I both in our conversations with other leaders is that they're first and foremost showing up to the crisis as human beings which is saying, okay, this is what the world needs right now. Then what's called of us as a leader is to take care of our people as an organization. So we're seeing that as kind of a first and foremost, whereas and in prior evolutions, I think when we first started looking at sustainable or responsible business before having to make the case on saying you take care of people, when in reality now what we see is first and foremost, people first. We might furlough people, but we as leaders are gonna not, uh, not take pay 
uh, pay, perhaps we might take cuts, so sharing the pain. Um, I think we're also then seeing a wider circle of care that says our circle isn't just our people, it's also the people who help us to do our business in the world. So what we've also seen from leaders is saying, okay, we're actually going to take care of our suppliers, and particularly the smaller suppliers, and whether that means that we're going to extend credit like uh, Paul's successor, Alan Jope, has done at Unilever. So they say we take care of our people, we take care of our suppliers, and by that we means we're going to provide some liquidity. If the financial market isn't doing it, then we're going to at least honor our contracts. And we've seen that the same way in fashion as well. And we're seeing leaders like uh, Helena, the CEO of H&M, yeah, who along with Manny with PVH are then mobilizing fashion leaders to sign up to a pact that says we're going to honor our commitments for vulnerable garment workers. Well, why would you do that? Because as a leader, Helena, Manny, Alan, these leaders are human beings are saying we're in positions of power. We are going to take care of our employees, our team, our people there. And our people is also going to be the garment workers, the suppliers, people who need credit, people who help us to access the markets on that. So I think for us, we're heartened by the type of leadership that we're seeing. Because if leadership is contextual, the way that we see many leaders, not all, but many leaders showing up in this crisis is first and foremost as a human being that is playing the game for others and not just for short-term self-interest. So essentially, Diana, they're living multi-stakeholder. They're not just talking about it. And the other piece on that that we haven't talked about, that's putting people first, but we're also seeing people are also saying we can't also then take shortcuts when it comes to sustainability and environmental responsibility. And we're hearing leaders saying, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned that we might backslide on some of that too. So it's heartening then for us to have leaders in that conversation that we're saying, yes, we're worried about business continuity, but we'll take care of that. Yes, we're worried about our people and we're worried about our, our broader supply chain, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna uh, let go of the line that we need to hold on sustainability and on responsibility. And I think Paul is seeing that even more in the work that he's leading with the UN Global Compact uh, with, as chair of the International Chamber of Commerce as well, in addition to his role as a co founder of Imagine. Thank you very much. Um, so what do we need from our leaders in terms of business, politics, society, uh, um, as we need to restart and redesign our economies? And I might also add, we need to think about how we can restart our economies with obviously people and planet at the heart of it. So um, Valerie, if you can take the question, and Paul, I mean, if you, if you can uh, take the question again, uh, for perhaps for, from a different standpoint. Sorry, Diana, what was the question? <laughs> so, <laughs> are you coming to me or are you coming to Paul? <laughs> to you. So what do we need from our leaders in business, politics, society in general? And as we need to restart and redesign our economies, what these leaders need to have and, and how we can actually have this leadership with, with planet and people, perhaps at the heart of it. I think the first thing that we're seeing, and I'm, I'm really curious to see what Paul says on this, but I think we're really aligned on this. I think the first thing that we're asking people to do and that we're seeing is to say, it's not about getting back on track. It's not about saying, can we get back to business as usual? I can't wait until we can start getting back. This is an opportunity to fundamentally rethink what we've been creating and how we've been doing it. And so I think the, the real leadership challenge and opportunity is for people who are not saying, I can't wait, let's get back to business as usual. Business as usual, we were already calling for business unusual, right? We were saying, when people are saying, let's get back on track, we would say the track was already, the train tracks were kind of, you know, heading into the wrong direction. And that wasn't a light at the end of the tunnel. That is an oncoming train. So if I think back to one conversation I was really heartened by, I was a CEO, a woman in China. Um, and she was saying, you know, well, what's coming to you is what's, you know, we're ahead of the curve, essentially, right? So, you know, you'll see this in a few weeks when you start getting back to normal. And so she was saying about how, as a CEO, that they had taken care of their people. They weren't taking uh, pay and compensation as leaders on that. And she was also saying what was interesting was to see clear skies over Beijing. And she said what was said, she said, Valerie, though, there's a part of me that says we know, we know there's no planet B. We know we need a new plan for business, what the B team and others are doing. And we actually talked about positive luxury in our conversation, Diana, that we need this. She said, but at some level deep down, I get heartened when I see the pollution coming back because it means we're back on track. And we had a conversation with God, that's terrible, right? That we, we don't want to get back on track. And so then she and I had a conversation about what that means. And actually leadership now is not about saying, how do we get back on track? It's really seizing the opportunity to have an entirely new kind of conversation. 
Paul, I don't know if you agree with that. or if you see Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think the crisis has shown us three things is that you cannot have a, um, cannot have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. So the relationships between biodiversity, climate and health are increasingly understood. I think the, clim the crisis has also shown the lack of uh, social cohesion. This was already an economy very much skewed towards the few that have all and the majority that doesn't. And uh, this has been even more so exposed. The most vulnerable professions that we need the most, like the nurses, the truckers, the people working to provide us with food and, and the people in the stores were the most underpaid and least protected. And that has come to the foreground. And then the third thing is that people that do well during this crisis, well relatively, are the ones that work in cooperation and form these new partnerships. And these are the skills, you know. So businesses, I believe that businesses are going to compete longer term, far more on, on things like trust or on responsibilities and on creating these deep relationships with all of their stakeholders. And obviously these relationships should be based very strongly based on shared purpose and values. And as a result, it gets to a higher level of moral leadership where you really truly have to put the interest of others ahead of your own before you start to look at yourself and, and actually doing so, you know, you'll be better off. So the leaders that do best in this environment are the leaders that speak the truth, that, uh, that take the science for what it is, that give wise guidance, that actually take courageous actions and, and provide a certain sense of hope. And the changes that we need are quite significant. We need to decarbonize our global economy. We need to fix our food system. We need a new health system. We need to ensure that the financial markets become again subservient to the real economy. These are major systems changes that are needed if we don't want to go through these crises every 10 years. We had the financial crisis and had to spend a boatload of money. The outcome wasn't that good. It created more inequality, populism, political uh, isolation. And now we have the COVID crisis. We're spending again over 10 trillion. Let's at least be sure that we spent it right so that we don't have to go through this every 10 years or increasingly more often. So it needs leaders that are also bold and actually are able to disrupt the system and as Valerie said, redesign versus returning to the old. I hear so many people saying, oh, wouldn't it be good if we could go back to before COVID? Or can we not restart the economy? That would be a tragedy because that would be totally disregarding the, the drivers that got us to this terrible situation in the first place. So these are the courageous leaders that we need, these moral leaders that are going to make the difference, not only for themselves in making a, a difference in life, but also for the companies that they represent. Diana, can I pick up on something Paul was just saying there about kind of the next level of leadership? Of Does course. It really to the core of Imagine in one way. And what he was talking about is really being able to see leaders that not only put the interests of others ahead of themselves, yeah, and think beyond kind of their normal kind of small set of, of shareholders or broader set of stakeholders, we really see the next level of leadership as being those who will bring together, yeah, their collective across industries to work for the common good. And that has been super heartening and empowering. I know Paul was actually co-chairing uh, last week uh, the Fashion Pact Steering Committee. It was a group of CEOs. And that now, when I think, of, what was it, about a year ago now, almost, um, that you know, the Fashion Pact was just an idea. Uh, and really, there was a, a moment in time where you had CEOs across the fashion industry come together to say, we're going to sign up together to raise the industry standard for everyone. And at the time, there was only on the agenda was only on kind of planetary and, and uh, uh, sustainability metrics, right? Regenerative cotton and plastics. And so what we also see now and last week was now the Fashion Pact um, has gone to, I think, what are we now? 67? Is that 66. Right? Yeah, 66. Uh, 66 six CEOs who've come together and human rights is now on the agenda. Yeah, so what that was the conversation that was happening. A little bit later on, uh, Paul and I will be in conversation, in a private conversation with uh, CEOs across the value chain and food who have asked to come together, who are saying not only how do we help mobilize so that we can use this as a moment to really step up as individuals, but as a company, what is it, companies, as a, as a value chain, what is it together that we can do that we could do? 
And we really are heartened by that because that really comes at putting the best interest of others and of yourself. It comes at looking at what is possible and what's needed. And I think this notion of what we're calling courageous collectives is really the next pioneering leadership that we're seeing uh, in, the, in the crisis. And, and we're seeing that across different industries. I mean, we're using fashion and food as examples. We're also seeing that in other sectors as well. But for us, that starts to become the new definition of leadership. Really, I mean, it's almost like hygiene that says, if you're a leader today of a business, you've got to be a responsible business. You have to take care of people. You've got to take care of the planet. That is just accepted. And, and it's not acceptable that says, even when the tough is, the times are tough, that you're going to skimp on that. So what's the next frontier is people who are then saying, okay, if we're really going for a world where everyone is fed, if, ever, if that's what we're really doing, and we're, by the way, we're saying we had a broken food system to begin with, then how do we come together across a value chain from ingredients, manufacturers, retailers, all of that, investors, to then say, how do we unite to go really hard and fast together to make a sustainable food system or to make fashion work for all? And that courageous collective really is the new, new frontier of leadership as we see it. I mean, I could not agree with you uh, more in terms of that we need collaboration or the, to actually further the sustainability agenda. But um, my question to actually to you both is, um, for where we sit at Positive Luxury, we see that a lot of companies are willing to talk about sustainability, but there are not that many companies that are willing to put the investment uh, that is required today uh, in order to do this system change. I mean, of course, there's exceptions, but the reality is that um, considering this, you know, th this money that has been spent and this contraction in the economy, this, this you know, money is tight. So how do we entice uh, leaders, today's leaders, today's CEOs, and those people which are budget holders to actually, to keep investing in what is really important, what really matters, because sustainability is not negotiable. So, I mean, Paul, this is a question to you. You have been the CEO of Unilever for a long time and you have gone through, you know, great times and tough times in terms of recession. So how would you, what would you say to those people that are, you know, counting pennies and trying to save money on sustainability? Well, there are always trade-offs in life, but we should not have a trade-off on the future of humanity. What we're now doing is incurring enormous costs individually and collectively to get out of the COVID crisis. And what we have discovered is that it is increasingly clearer to a broader group of people that it is cheaper to avoid the issues, to work on prevention, than to deal with the consequences. It is interesting in this crisis, but companies that were more focused on the longer term, multi-stakeholder models tend to do better already in this crisis. The ESG companies' performance is higher. We see the green bond market continuing to Excel. We see the financial market uh, demanding uh, different behaviors now. 66% of the questions that are posed during this shareholder season are around the environmental and social parts, and the social part coming up rapidly, as Valerie was saying. We're seeing also the consumers asking for this. 90% of the consumers don't want to go back, rightfully so, to where they came from, and they're holding their companies to higher standards. When we have seen during this crisis, companies disregarding uh, safety or, or livelihoods that the consumers broadly are calling them out and forcing them into a different type of behavior. We've also seen most importantly that technology has advanced. In many places, for example, the cost of green energy is significantly cheaper than the cost of fossil fuel. In fact, in 70% of the world. So whilst we understand that individually companies have some trade-offs to deal with, what Valerie was talking about by working collectively together, you can actually overcome some of these barriers and move your models forward faster. And the companies that do will provide better jobs, more secure jobs, will have employees that are more satisfied and engaged, will actually have a lower cost of capital because the financial markets will support them and they will be better placed to survive in this undoubtedly tough environment moving forward. And that's where we need to get individually as companies, but on the bigger things collectively. When we put the fashion companies together, the 66 companies, they collectively agreed to cut their carbon emission to stay below the one and a half degrees, which is called net zero by 2050. They collectively agreed to go out of single use plastics and to work 
as a third point on regenerative uh, cotton. Because you do that collectively, I'm of the opinion that you can actually do it cheaper and better and more resilient mm -hmm. if you do it together than, than if you would all go on your own and, and have a narrow definition of CSR or, or ESG that doesn't uh, reflect the multi-stakeholder interest. So this is a, going to be a big competitive advantage, this green economy that we're going to create. Healthier environments, healthier living, better jobs, more security. I think that's the future that we aspire to and that's the future that we need to drive to individually and collectively. Thank you. Um, and uh, I mean, um, I, I'd like to uh, kind of give the opportunity to Valerie to have the last word. So I'll, I'll start with you. Um, I mean, in our audience, we have small companies, medium companies, big companies, and not just across fashion. We work in the beauty industry, uh, travel and hospitality, premium drinks, uh, jewelry, um, and watches, of course. So um, what are the top three things that CEOs and leaders today could do in order to navigate this short term, which is quite rough waters, and then kind of take the company um, to a safe environment or safe-ish environment by 2021 that hopefully it will be a much more kind of, I guess, fertile ground for, for investments and, 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 and to kind of, okay, not business as usual, but business as usual in the sense that we will be able to have the ability to travel perhaps a little bit more, to interact with one another, to go to events together, and to have that kind of sense of social normality that right now we, we don't have. So what are the three things that uh, you would suggest uh, or, or share that uh, people can do or leaders can do today? Was that to Paul? You wanted to go to him first and then come to me? Please? Yes, please, Paul. Sorry to you. Well, what leaders now need to do is this is going to be a, a tough environment. There's no question about it. And we need to be honest about that. The um, economies are going to contract in many countries 20, 30%. The fashion industry, like the tourist and travel industry, like many parts of retail, have been especially affected by this. So next to saving lives that the industry has done tremendously well together, or protecting livelihoods, we now have to collectively protect the sector and, as we talked about, come out better than what we went in. For that, it has a few leadership skills that are absolutely needed. The first one is to feel comfortable with disrupting yourself. The new normal that we need to create is not going to be the same as where we came from, and you need to feel comfortable with that. If you want to go back to the old way, you're in the process of obsoleting yourself and your companies. The second thing is, in the tougher choices that we now have, pick the ones that are, we call it the harder rights versus the easier wrongs, but work with your multiple stakeholders and ensure that your business model is more resilient for all your partners in your value chain. The fashion industry for a long time has outsourced its value chain and actually by doing so also outsourced its responsibilities. I don't think you can do that anymore moving forward. So you have to take these responsibilities across your value chain and collectively work together. Then the third thing is obviously the partnership that we talked about. We can, this is business unusual and we need to really think about uh, different forms of business individually and collectively to come out of this crisis. It's not an industry that has um, uh, naturally worked together. We've now created the fashion pact and 66 companies go together, but there's still a lot of work to be done. But first and foremost, you need to protect this industry and move it to a longer term sustainable and equitable model for everybody to survive. So this level of partnership that is needed needs to be driven very fast to higher levels. I'm very pleased to see how the industry went together to produce face masks or surgical, surgical gowns, or how they put their value chain uh, to, the, to the availability of uh, the making of PPE materials. So there is a partnership that has emerged when a lot of the fashion companies have done heroic things short term, and we certainly don't want to lose that as we face the longer term challenges. Thank yeah. you very much. I mean, Valerie, what's, what's your take on this? 
Yeah, I mean, I would just um, say yes and amen to everything that Paul just said. I think fundamentally um, leadership is people who are occupying positions, right? So in organizations, the first and foremost is to, is to show up as a full human being. Right, to bring not just I was trained on this is what leaders are optimizing for, and this is just so I'm gonna bring my whole self into this and I'm gonna leave from here and here. And I think that you know the more that we're learning about neuroscience and the brain, the more that we're understanding the kind of human organism to understand that that's actually when we have the most power, when we are the most creative, when we see the most possibility, and actually we're gonna be more productive at when we lead from that place. So that's first and foremost. The second I think is a great trend picking up on what Paul is saying is irrespective of the direction of travel, we are seeing so much innovation right now. So it, how can you uh, take the frame that says a crisis is an opportunity or it, maybe it's an opportunity uh, that would be a tragedy if we missed it as a chance to kind of rethink fundamentally our business and our model. And I know even at Positive Luxury right now, I mean, you guys even just doing these types of webinars, which are providing great value to your community, right? You're saying, okay, how do we show up? What are the new innovations that we can do? And so one of the things that we would also say is if you just take fashion, for example, there's already so many great innovations. So it's going to uh, fashion for good. You know, I know you've been there in Amsterdam uh, with what they're leading on. And you can see already that you've got technologies there that allows us for traceability in our supply chain, threads, where you can literally go through all the way to see where the fabrics came from, or uh, leather that is being grown from mushrooms. I mean, so these are kind of uh, uh, innovations that capture the mind. Well, right now, as it relates to the possibility, everywhere you look right now, people are saying, well, interestingly, we can, we've integrated ways of working way faster than we ever thought we would be. Why? We have the digital capabilities and the technology that's there. So I really think that, the, you know, as a leader, to first and foremost say, are we showing up as a full human being? Are we really seeing this as the opportunity? Once we've got business continuity, obviously that's the first and foremost you have to stabilize. Then there is a phase of leadership through the crisis. Yeah. The third phase we see really is how are you leading for the new? How are you creating the, from an entirely new space and you're designing for a world that works for all and you're designing for a, a planet that is uh, sustainable and that actually it's regenerative. And that really is taking the invitation fully that we have from the COVID crisis, if you even want to call it that way, which is, I love uh, how some people are talking about it as the great pause. The great pause. And I like how somebody else is referring to it as the portal. And we think about well, what's the portal? What are we looking into? So if we say it, it's a great pause for us to take a little time out, get a new perspective on what this thing is that we're playing and how we're playing it for and over what time horizon. And then what's the portal that we're looking through? And I would say that there's all the innovations that we could potentially then see are potentially out there. They might just need to be then grabbed and accelerated. And we will do that when we do that together. And we'll do that when we come from a place of saying, you know what, business as usual wasn't working. Back to normal is not an option. Yeah. So what is it that we are going to actively design and create for both people and for planet? That's great. Thank you so much. And um, I've got lots of really interesting questions. Um, so uh, the first one is to Paul from Marco says, how can we motivate today's profit driven leaders to become moral leaders? Yeah, I think it is well uh, shown Marcos and it is a great question that the single minded pursuit of profit is not going to bring you long term prosperity. Uh, we've seen in the US the number of companies that are publicly traded over the last 30 years go down from about 8000 to 4000 behind the shareholder primacy concept. And we've also seen the average length of the CEOs of these companies go down to about four and a half years now. And that's not very much. It wouldn't be very motivating to be an employee in a company where the single-minded pursuit is profit and where many of the actions that you do lead to satisfying your shareholders but not taking care of your stakeholders. These models don't really work longer term and there's enough evidence of that in, in the public domain. And you see also these companies that were so minoptically focused on the shareholders struggling through this recession. And I think increasingly struggling uh, coming out of this. Not many employees, especially the young, want to work for them anymore. Young have purpose driven all over them. Uh, the financial market is getting really uh, irritated by them now at mass. They are demanding that companies take responsibilities on carbon emissions, on labor standards, and increasingly the consumers are calling out and voting with their wallets. So the companies that want to continue to pursue the Milton Friedman 
shareholder primacy wrote, I wish them well to the graveyard of dinosaurs. <laughs> I love that. That should definitely be a, a quote. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. Um, the next question is from Joanna, and actually this could go to either Paul or Valerie. The next generation of leaders are still at school. Uh, do you think education today is working towards forming great leaders? And if so, uh, what countries, uh, what countries uh, according to you, are doing the best job at it? Yeah, it's interesting. I saw that question in the chat. Short answer? No. <laughs> I, I don't think that they are. But I think that, um, I think that it's when, when schools and education is putting it in the context of what the world needs versus what does it mean to be a business leader. So it depends on what you're talking about. I think that if you talk about exactly as Paul was saying, picking up on that great quote that we say, yeah, wish them well to the Milton School and Graveyard. Um, we think that particularly business schools that are educating only on that paradigm, who were saying the business of business is just business and as a good leader it means that you need to optimize for your shareholder premise and then you've got to do good and then you can do some csr and some responsible sense of business and that's nice to have but not necessary that's not preparation on it and i think you see others and then we see others i mean paul and i are both affiliated with uh, oxford at the site business school where i both teach leadership and uh, and curate um, leadership programs for executives and paul is the chairman of the board and i think what we see that's a leading edge about saeed just to take that as an example is that they talk about business in the wider world context and you start from what does the world need what are the purpose problems that we need to then solve and then how do you as business and how do you as individual leaders then operate within that and that's a very interdisciplinary piece right it isn't just saying it's business is over here that's also the humanities and so if we look at that it says human beings are ultimately the ones that are making decisions organizations are made up of organisms deeply understanding human beings organizations are not operating outside of their own context which is a planetary one. So what is the environmental context that you're then leading within? And so schools and education facilities that are actually talking about how do we then educate whole human beings within a whole ecosystem approach of that we are on a host that is this beautiful planet. And if you are leading an organism called a business, comprised of a bunch of organisms called human beings, and you're doing that within a larger frame on that, that you're then leading for that bigger perspective as well. So I'm, I'm encouraged by it. And then I think what I would also just say is Paul and I also saw in Davos that kind of next level of leadership is schools that are fundamentally saying we need to rethink education paradigms and let's come together across other schools and bring together these institutions to then say, how do we do it together? And so that notion of the collective leadership is also what we're encouraged by. I don't know, Paul, if you are seeing something. Different. No, I agree with that totally. I think the, um, obviously it's not only universities. It would be overly simplified to say, we don't have enough leaders in the world, which is true. We are lacking leaders and trees, as I often say, yeah. but it's not only because of the academic institutions. We are being formed throughout our lives and our, our university experience, our educational experience is just a part of that. But we need to continuously learn and unlearn. And great leaders have that ability to do that, to free up space, to let go of things. As difficult to unlearn as it is to learn new things. But we do need to move our educational system, which is notoriously slow to change, away from defining capitalism as optimizing returns on financial capital, and also broaden that definition to include returns on social and environmental capital. And that's that multidisciplinary that Valerie was talking about. I think the side business school with people like Colin Myers and Bob Eccles and Peter Trufano himself, the Dean, are understanding that very well. And that's why we are involved because it's one of the leading schools in that respect. But we need to move out of this narrow definition of what success looks like. And that's the same for countries. As long as we are going to define success in growing our GDP, we miss a lot of things. When GDP was invented, it was just invented as an industrial output measure, but not as an economic measure. It doesn't measure negative externalities, doesn't measure positive externalities, doesn't measure the depletion of natural resources, doesn't talk about income inequality, it's an average number. So there's many shortcomings. And as you well know, you, you treasure what you measure. And we are then in desperate need to broaden the definition of success and the business schools have a key role to play in that respect as well. Thank you. And um, this is an excellent question uh, coming uh, from Peter. It says, 
Uh, you talk about young leaders, but how do we change all investors? <laughs> this, this question, you must smile. Uh, so yeah, I love the answer for that as well. <laughs> Great question. Thank you, for, uh, Peter. Yeah, Peter, we need to change everybody because we're in this together. The amount of change that is needed and the magnitude of the change requires a lot of um, uh, change uh, from all parties involved. I don't think it's as simple as the investors, although um, uh, we've seen an increasing uh, amount of companies moving to ESG, uh, environmental, social and governance reporting, we still don't have global standards. We cannot really see the comparability, the materiality and the interpretation that is out there. It's a lot of greenwashing as well. There are very few CEOs that are able to explain it properly to the investor community. They're sticking to quarterly reporting. They're linking compensation to shares and share performance, which leads to share buybacks or special dividends and, and financial manipulation of their companies. So first and foremost, we need to start with the CEOs themselves and the boards. When I took over as CEO of Unilever nearly 12 years ago now, I abolished guidance, I abolished quarterly reporting, I put a compensation system to the long term. We put measures out there with a Unilever sustainable living plan that we communicated. And to our surprise, we actually found that a lot of the financial market is interested. A lot of the funds in the financial market, not all, they are short-term investors, but a lot of funds in the financial market are basically pension funds. These are called institutional investors. And they need to be sure that they have a return 15, 20 years from now when you are going to retire. And not only that, they also need to be sure that it is a world out there that you can retire in. So surprisingly, there are many investors that would be interested if companies would be able to better explain it or industries themselves. And that is an effort that we need to do. Then many of the investors themselves are basically agents. They're asset managers. They're not the asset owners. And unfortunately, we've created too big a gap in this world between the asset owners and the asset managers. And what we're trying to do now is to get the asset owners themselves to speak up much more. Interestingly, many companies that complain about short-term pressures or investors not caring, they all have pension plans. And the way they invest these pension plans uh, with these asset managers, they are actually the asset owners and they should put much higher demands on the types of investments that should happen. Longer term, uh, ESG-based, decarbonizing, so that the demands coming in from the asset managers, uh, sorry, from the asset owners will actually be the biggest galvanizer to change here. Thank you. Um, I mean, either to, to you, Valerie or, or Paul, um, can you explain how a, good, how a good leadership emerges and uh, how to deploy good leadership? Yeah, Diana, I'd love to actually answer that while answer, picking up on what Paul was just saying about the investors kind of piece. Mm -hmm. So how does good leadership emerge? It starts with an individual taking a stand and that provides courage for others. So if you look at Paul's example, he said, right, this is why we're here. We're not here to then just return profits to shareholders. We're here for the greater good. Therefore, we put our business in service of that. And then now we have actually, I think, a new level of leadership, which is saying sustainable development goals. It isn't good enough just to say, we're going to be purpose driven in the abstract. We're going to be responsible in the abstract. Purpose in that level is passe. There is the global goals. There's what the planet needs. There is then saying, how are we then in service of that? And within each of these industries and with these leaders, if you see more people that like Paul take a stand, it starts to galvanize others. We were working recently and I saw a note people were saying, how is Imagine working with companies? So what Imagine is working with companies is very similar to that. We'll work with the CEO and the C-suite to then say, let's fundamentally think about what the world needs from us now. What is the goals that we're then lining up to? And this isn't about tick the box exercise or we're all 17. This is about saying, where do we have passion and a license and a right to play? And when we do so, that's also going to drive our business results and performance. And if that CEO, ultimately that courageous, heroic leader, then putting a leadership team around them that says, we stand for, we believe, our business is for. And we had such a powerful story most recently with one of the companies we've been working with that, that last year at their AGM, they received a vote of no confidence. It was the relationship in terms of the management and the investors was so fractured that they were receiving a no confidence. The last AGM that they participated in, after they had said, actually, we are going 
going for a bigger game for what the world needs. We're putting sustainability on the forefront. And I won't say who it was or what the language was on that. But what their investors told them at the AGM was, we believe in you because of your sustainability stand. Now, obviously, they need to make business results. Obviously, they need to show that they're meeting their financial targets and their metrics. But they've then been able to bring their along by being courageous as a CEO and as a wider leadership team. Yeah, standing up and just saying, this is the way we do business around here. This is why we exist. And then there's a bit of an alignment that says, if you care about that, if you're part of that, then get alongside it. And I just think that there is a moment right now, instead of admiring the problem and saying, how are we going to bring the rest of the world along for all of us to take the opportunity of COVID that says the world is different. Everything is possible now. People are rethinking this. And not to ask and wait, I saw a note where somebody saying, you know, I've got a meeting with uh, Sadiq Khan, the, ma the mayor, and how do I get SDGs on the agenda? Assume that it's on the agenda. Ask the question if it's not. Say, where are we lining up in terms of the global goals on this? Because we can't be spending money in a way that is inconsistent with what the, what the goals say. And I think just having voice and the assumption being we're starting from it's a new normal. Is we're starting from business is fundamentally needing to rethink its responsibilities in society and the wind is at our back and not to lose the portal and the moment that we have. Yeah. So, so I 100% agree. I think many of the, the leadership traits that we have are, uh, are really evolving throughout our lives. We are developing continuously to become the leaders we aspire to be and, and we go through our lives having some experiences, some uh, crucible ones that, that stick with us and that form us, which might be the death of a family, which might be an enormous business challenge, which might be a crisis like the COVID, which might be finding ourselves in a situation that is uh, uncomfortable. And that is a experience that we need to embrace. I mean, the real leaders uh, are people that first and foremost discover that they're in a position that is fortunate. Um, I, I feel that we are in a very fortunate position, having had our education, having not had to worry about food, um, getting having decent jobs and can live and work where we want. So then there is a sense of duty to put yourself to the, uh, to the service of others. And the second leadership thing comes from a, a deep uh, sense of, um, of, of anxiety when you see deep injustice, when you see women not having same rights as men, when you see absolute poverty in some parts of the world, when you see people deprived of sanitation and water or working in circumstances that you don't want to work in, slave labor, child labor, etc. A great leader, in a great leader, this causes anxiety to do something about it. Great leaders are people that are well aware of what is going on in the world and have a high level of appetite to engage and to do something about that. And that's basically built off a foundation of a strong core and a purpose, a strong purpose ultimately to put yourself to the surface of others. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Paul. Valerie, last word. No pressure. You know, my last, <laughs> is, my last word is if anybody hasn't been reading the chat, they should read the chat. <laughs> <laughs> So many great answers. I mean, basically, I want to be looking for my thumbs up, thumbs up on this, right? People are saying things like, how do we create the immersive journeys that allow leaders to shift their mindsets? And we're like, yep, that's the game. And people are saying, you know, well, how do we bring more human-centered design to this? Yep, that's the game. So I think part of it is, is look at the chat, the answers, the questions that are asked, you have the answers there. And that's my last word on that. It says, fundamentally, <laughs> there's no... <laughs> Game. We're all living this thing up. So I basically say the answers are in the questions as well. The very fact that you're asking these questions is already showing that there is a planetary consciousness shift. The fact that people are actually feeling survivor's guilt right now when they say, you know what, you know, Corona might have actually improved my life. And kind of I get a bit of a pause and I'm like, you know, craving nature now and I'm a little concerned about people, you know, experiencing domestic violence or workers being laid off or homeless people. I think there's a greater level of empathy that's there. And so in some ways we would say, do see the possible. We're not being naive or Pollyannish about this, but the very questions that you're asking tell us already that we're already on a different plane in terms of our consciousness. And we're already thinking, how do we shift our thinking 
How do we shift mindsets so we can change behavior so we can have a world that works for everybody? So I'm, I'm optimistic and I, I'm optimistic that the people who tuned in today, you showed up because you care about this. You're not alone. A lot of people are wanting to have these conversations and are seeing this as a moment to be able to do so. So I think our invitation back to you is to lead in whatever places you're in. The conversations that you're in after you leave this, you're going to be zooming into other meetings and other kind of conversations is to understand that there is a movement and that this is a moment. And just by you being in this conversation with us, you are a part of that. Well, I cannot say anything else than thank you. Uh, big, big, big thank you to you, Paul, and to you, Valerie, for taking the time to share your knowledge and to share your enthusiasm and, and, and your passion on the topic with us. Um, so if you have time, you can answer some of the questions in the back of the Q&As uh, while Claudia actually does, does her remarks. And uh, but thank you so much, and hopefully see you soon. Uh, over to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Paul. Thank you, Valerie. I think we can all agree that it has been a very interesting session. So thank you. Uh, next week on Thursday, we'll be discussing the power of local with three amazing guests. So please reserve your spot now. Uh, register to our newsletter to reserve your spot to receive your invitation, and uh, stay safe. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>